<sighs> hey, everybody. Uh, if you can hear us, just uh, give us a hello. Hey, Jordan, how's it going? Um, and it's really a pleasure and an honor to have my friend John Craig here uh, on the Tennis Falls podcast. He is a fantastic coach. He's been on a couple of my summits now. And I'm sure many of you know that he is the founder of Performance Plus Tennis. Um, he's, he's a USPTA elite professional. Uh, he's also a racket fit certified coach as well and a host of other many amazing accomplishments. Um, I think you've been coaching for, what, over 35 years now, John? It has been a while, my man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. That's good. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I'm really excited to have you on because I want to talk to you about a topic that um, you put forth and that I think is intriguing and is super important and something that I wish I had developed better uh, for myself, which is our tennis foundation. And so we're going to ask John about how to, well, first, the, the importance of it, how to develop it. And uh, just the ins and outs of it so that you can either build a strong foundation now or um, or just, you know, maybe teach those principles to somebody else who uh, you think might need to uh, improve their their foundation and lay a good one. So, uh, John, uh, happy to have you on. And how's everything going? It's going great. We're having a little bit of an unusually cloudy day here in Southern California, uh, but uh... Everything's going pretty well. Uh, we're all back on the courts again, um, hoping that things stay stay well here. We hope everybody is doing uh, doing well, staying safe and healthy, and uh, getting back on the court, which I think is a great thing to do. So, love it, love it. That, yeah. That's great to hear. And yeah, speaking of, uh, just curious, obviously at this current time uh, in your area. Well, well, first off, let the uh, audience know exactly where you are right now. I am in Orange County. I live in uh, the city of Santa Ana, and I coach at the Newport Beach Tennis Club uh, down in Newport Beach. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And then so with that background, I was curious about the tennis, you know, are, are, is there coaching going on? Are people playing? Or what's it like out there? Yeah, I, uh, the clubs in the area are back in full swing. There are certainly some compliances and some, some procedures that we're all following uh, for safety reasons. But uh, for the most part, tennis is back in full swing here in Orange County. Good to hear. Good to yeah. hear. And um, what are some of the precautions that are uh, being taken by the facilities and the players and so forth? At our club, everyone is required to have their temperature taken when they come in. Uh, we're wearing masks when we're not on the court playing. Uh, there is an interval between rounds of play where we the club staff comes out and disinfects the court, sanitizes things, wipes things down. So. Uh, those are the primary things that uh, is taking place at our club. Good stuff, John. Yeah. Good to hear that. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering to to start off this uh, this topic, very important uh, topic, um, with um, what is the importance? Well, first off, what is the tennis foundation, and then we'll go into some other questions about it. Yeah, and I think that's really the the question. What is the tennis foundation, and why do we need it? And you know, I think that we could even get some answers here. How many of you want to achieve your full potential in tennis and feel like you can continue to improve? How many of you feel as though you want to be able to play for a lifetime? And how many of you really want to feel like you look and feel and play like that model player that we that we like to watch, that we feel really has the skills and the talents that we we envision we want to have that. I think everyone can answer yes to that. That's probably here. They all want to, we all want to improve. We all want to play for a lifetime. We want to try to reduce the risk of injuries. So, you know, the real key here is getting a foundation that enables you to achieve your full potential and reduce the risk of injuries and also look and feel and play with a lot of efficiency. And it ultimately allow you to develop your own style and be versatile. So, so many benefits to having the foundational principles built into your game. And without it, I think a lot of tennis players go out and they don't even, they just hope they're going to play well today, but they don't really have anything to fall back on if they don't. And they don't, they're just guessing as they're playing. And we want to take the guesswork out of the game. At the same time, we want to try to make the game as simple as we can. So. And um, how do most people, because I, I can probably guess that most people don't adequately build a proper foundation. So how do most people uh, build their their tennis foundation, um, and then we'll get into, you know, the differing, uh, approach there. Well, I think that that's a really interesting question. And I, and I, I would love to hear what people are thinking right now. Like, Hmm, did I ever really even build a foundation? Do I have a foundation? What is the foundation? So, um, you know, I think a lot of 
people take tennis lessons, but I, I don't know that the emphasis is always, you know, foundational in nature. Um, and so, you know, if I think of the foundation this way, I think of it as like, let's compare that to a home, to architecture. And if you think about the structure of an arch or architecture of a home, we look at the house, we see the, the obvious things. We see shutters and doors and treatments and things that make the house pretty. And that's kind of the style of the home. But if the foundation beneath that is weak, it's not going to be able to hold up under pressure. And ultimately, it is going to fail. And and then it's co comparing to tennis, it's kind of like not performing well and ultimately getting injured. So the structure really is the architecture beneath the game that people don't necessarily pay attention to that needs to be built and be solid. Yeah, good stuff, uh, John. Because I, yeah, I mean, I can venture back to my childhood and you know a lot of it was spent just kind of hitting around with with people and not really knowing what the fundamentals were and then later on in my tennis career you know i i there are these habits that are really difficult to break and you know certain areas of the game that you you've figured out you haven't been thinking about the correct way and um i mean where, where do you start because there's a lot of different areas of of tennis, of course, we have we have the mental game, fitness, technique, strategy. Um, so, is there one particular area where we need to start when it comes to the tennis foundation? Well, I, th I think we, you know, a couple things. Um, we talk about a lot of good players, and you're a really good player. And you mentioned when you were a kid, you just hit a lot of balls. You know, it, it was a disadvantage for me to start a little bit later in my my mid teens to really get focused on tennis. But ultimately, it became an advantage because I remember the journey of learning and developing the skills. And when I took lessons, I, I was very engaged and I remember what I learned. I think a lot of players that became very, very good at young ages just hit a lot of balls, but they really didn't know what they were really doing. They just got good. So to me, I was fortunate enough that I was able to really remember how I learned and, and translate that into teaching. Um, as far as the foundation is concerned, when we first start playing tennis, it's very physical. We're not really thinking about how to concentrate. Um, we're really just out there trying to figure out how to technically or physically play on the court. So the foundation that I focus on are the foundational principles that are physical in nature. And once the foundation is built, along with it comes confidence, growth and skills and improvement, and then the focus transfers more into tactics and then concentration and match play and experience and so forth. I, I just think it's so important to get your fundamentals right so that you can create shots and you can create strategies and have game styles and learn how to really play the game correctly. Gotcha, John. Yeah. And so I want to dive into uh, the physical aspect a bit that you mentioned. I mean, what, what exactly does that entail? Does it mean that we're working on our movement? Does it mean we're working on our building up our strength or uh, mobility? Is it something else? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, there's really, I see it as there's really five pillars of the foundation. And the first one really is about mobility and balance and footwork. If, if you don't have great footwork, you're not going to have mobility. You're not going to have agility. You're not going to be able to create a rhythm on the court. You're not going to be able to maintain a strong posture to play with. So you're just going to break down. So my first emphasis is really teaching players how to move on the court like athletes that are balanced and rhythmic and have great posture. And from then, you can actually build strokes a lot easier. So everything I do is built around movement first because that really is the basis of becoming a, a good tennis player without it. You can't play. So, yeah, exactly, John. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Dave Bailey, who's uh, very good at teaching uh, tennis footwork, and uh, we've had him on the summit as well several times. So, um, how do you build good footwork? Uh, I build footwork, and let's let's think talk about what footwork is. I don't really don't like the word footwork because it sounds like work. So I try to teach my students to learn how to play through their feet and realize that the strokes follow the feet and that moving the feet um, is fun. It's fun to get out there and move and glide and bounce around and, and, and be light on the court. So I have a series of exercises that I do with my students, includes jumping rope, includes uh, agility exercises on the court, movement and coordinated exercise, coordination exercises, rhythm exercises. 
things that build the skills before they even hit it, really hit a ball. And in my lessons, my students do a, uh, a routine warm up before every lesson that actually is building those movement skills, those rhythms, those balances, those movements. And over time, they get more and more skillful at that. And gradually that starts to just blend right into their tennis. Yeah, that's a great point, John. I was actually working on a a video uh, involving the dynamic warm up as well. And it's just really amazing that, uh, you know, a lot of people just look at it as a regular warm up when in fact, a lot of these exercises really forces your they force your body to to get you more balanced. And that's such a big part of tennis, especially when you're on the run, uh, you really need to have good stability on one leg. And so um, yeah, that that's really great to hear that. Um, and, and as far as the you know, the, the difference between foundational principles and, and style, I mean, what, what can you explain kind of the difference between those con, the two concepts? Yeah, you know, style, if we look at tennis players, how many, two, how many tennis players look like someone else? We're all individuals. It, it, it's like we, we all have different things that we do, different nuances that are based on our body type or athletic type, whatever it is. No two players really look or play alike. So style is really what reveals itself naturally once your foundation is built. The foundation is beneath the style that most people really aren't looking for. That is the architecture that allows your natural style to evolve and, and become, become natural, to become real. So and the foundation is really the key that allows a natural sense of style to come out, as well as different game styles, versatility, all those things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. And so a couple of people said that my volume was a little bit low. So hopefully, yeah. uh, you know, I've adjusted that a bit. Hopefully you can hear me better. Just let okay. me know. Great. Um, and uh, what are, you know, just to hammer this home a bit more, what is the, you know, what are the limitations of not building a proper tennis foundation? Why should we really concentrate on, on doing that and put forth our full effort in, in that? Yeah, I, th I think that especially for adult players, and I, I assume that the majority of, of our audience are adults that are looking to get better. If, if you don't know your foundational principles, then you are kind of guessing when you're out playing. And you, when you get under pressure in particular, you're, you're probably going to lack confidence because you don't believe in what you're doing because you're not really quite sure what to zero in on. So I, I think that if you don't get your foundation solid, you're putting limits on your growth not only in the long run, but you also are limiting what you potentially can do under pressure today. So that, that's a big factor. Right. For me, I, I think confidence in your play is there's an underlying self-belief in what you do and why you do it. So you allow yourself to be free to play with confidence. You know, the other, the other drawback from not having a good foundation and, and one of the main reasons that adult tennis players stop playing tennis are injuries. And the other reason is people get tired of feeling like they can't get better, so they get frustrated and they quit. But if we talk about injuries, there are really two types of injuries in tennis. There is the obvious injury where, oh, I pulled a calf muscle and I can't play for two weeks. Or I fell and broke my ankle and I can't play for six weeks. And then you get therapy and you come back. Those are actually not the worst injuries to have. The worst injuries to have are what I call workaround injuries. And that's that nagging thing that pain that you deal with, but then you're constantly compensating for. And that's a ticking time bomb. And those types of injuries happen when you're out of alignment, out of balance, and you're, and you're just play, trying to play through it. And ultimately, it becomes a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, John. Because um, it's one of those things where if you get, I guess, a full-blown injury, let's say, then you actually go out and you go to the doctor or the PT and you get it fixed. Um, whereas when you have the nagging injury, you say, oh, I can play through it. I can play through it. And then gradually you just discombobulate your, your body and, and, and your balance and everything's off. Um, so that's a great, great point there, John. Appreciate that. So uh, in thinking about players uh, who have been playing for years, uh, even myself, um, can we still build that foundation uh, despite having been playing already and maybe picking up bad habits already along the way? Yeah, you know, I, in my experience, you definitely can improve and, and strengthen the foundation beneath your game by just knowing what to focus on and then having a sequence of practice sessions that allow these things to happen. And 
and they're and they're pretty easy to insert into the game for most people. Um, hold on a second. I've got a crazy dog. I'm going to go grab her. I'll be right back. No problem. No problem. Yeah. And uh, so everybody, just while John is getting his dog uh, there, uh, I've been working on a bunch of different uh, YouTube videos for you all, uh, in, especially with regards to fitness. So we'll get that out there soon. John there is back. That was quick. Uh, she, let's see. I played a squirrel in the front yard. There she is. Uh, oh, Basketball. what's up? Well, hey. What's the name? Kenzie's her name. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Crazy. I like it. Oh, right. uh, Stephen actually has a question. Um, John, will you have a video showing your on-court routine that demonstrates the mobility that you work to develop? You've got plenty of technique on video. What say you? <laughs> uh, Steve is actually a member uh, at Performance Plus Tennis. In fact, we had a contest on uh last week on the YouTube channel uh, that was on one of the key principles on the forehand, and he was one of the contest winners. So, Steve, um, in the membership hub, you will see the warm-up routine, and that's where it is. Nice, nice. So we have a nice comment. Jordan says you have a cute dog. I agree. <laughs> okay, that's great. You want to see her again? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> she is. What's up? Hey there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, Down Gene. you go. Sweet. Um, and, and yeah, so, oh gosh, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought with the, uh, the foundation, but yeah, we were saying that, that players can indeed build their foundation, even if they've been playing for years. So say if they've been, you know, just picking up bad habits and things like that, and now they feel a little frustrated about their game and they're thinking, oh, now I'm unable to, to go back and, and, you know, do anything about it. So you posit that we can indeed, uh, still develop a good foundation, right? Yeah, if you know what the, the pillars are and you work on them and you go out with, on the court with the intention of focusing on one, maybe two things at once, you can actually make a lot of improvement. You know, and I'll just give you a perfect example. A lot of players are not really aware of their posture when they're playing. Mm. So uh, they play with poor posture and they get out of alignment and, they, and they're doing that in, in the high repetition sport we're playing. They're doing that hundreds and hundreds of times. And there comes that nagging injury. And... So if we just focus on posture, it will make a big, big difference. And the posture feeds right back into footwork because if you have good footwork and you know where some of the other things are that are key, like contact ranges, and you, and you focus on staying in your posture, you can execute better, stay in alignment, and reduce your chances of injury. So it's a simple concept um, in a way. And if you get out and focus on it, you can make a drastic improvement uh, in that area. Got it. Got it. And one thing that you said that's really brilliant is to remember to focus on one or two things at a time because it can be very frustrating and just uh, put your energy and spread it in all different areas if you're trying to fix many different things at a time. Uh, and I mean, do you find this to be a problem, John, as well, you know, perhaps with some coaches who are just trying to teach too many things at a time? Is that something that you find as well? Well, I think that, you know, in our, our desire to get better, we're, we're trying to see, get as much information as we can. And in today's world, there's so much information available that we can overconsume it. And it ultimately just becomes a cloud in our head. Uh, and then we do think about too many things. And, and I, would, I think that everyone should try to replace thinking when you're on the court with just feeling. Just feel what you're trying to do. Don't overthink how to do it. Feel what you're trying to do. And I would say focus on one, maybe two things at a time and come to the realization that you come to the court with the habits you have that day and you really can't, can't unravel those in a match. You can't play a match and try to replace bad habits with good ones or yeah. think about your posture and all this stuff. You, you really can't do that because it's too complicated. So the key is, is to get into an effective practice routine where you can make some of these adjustments. Yeah, perfect, John. And so you mentioned that your your primary focus in the beginning to build a great foundation is going to be footwork, and I agree. As you mentioned, if you can't get to the ball, then what's the technique? You know, it's not it's pretty much worthless. So, um, once we take care of the 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 physical, the footwork aspect, then you mentioned other areas of our game. So what's the next area that that we focus on, and then also how do we focus on it, and how do we develop that? Okay, great. You know, I, I just want to kind of go back to what footwork, the key thing that footwork really enables us to do is keep balanced. Mm -hmm. And when we see great players play, 
and you know we can say who's the greatest male player in terms of balance on the tour right now mm. i'd love to get the answers punch some answers in yeah i've got my answer you probably have yours but balance is what enables us to look good play well and execute well and reduce the chances of injury so the balance is the key thing that allows so many other things to evolve and balance is a component of the, of the footwork so mm -hmm. um and to elaborate a little bit more on balance, I teach my students uh, to create like a cylinder of balance around them where they outstretch their arms, they make a circle, and I tell them that's their cylinder of balance. And that cylinder is going to move with them everywhere they go. And they want to stay inside that cylinder. They want to stay in that posture as much as they can. And so there's really two types of balances in tennis. There's the posture or the, or the deliberate inside the cylinder balance. And then there is the adaptive balance. And I'd like to get people's opinions on who they think has the best adaptive balance on the mm. tour. Interesting. Yeah, we got some answers, I think, for your original question. Okay. Uh, Cobb thinks Novak. Um, Gene says Federer. But um, we will see. Uh, what does Steve says? Don't have to worry too much about injury. I set up. A lot of obstacle courses for movement. Interesting. Nice. Very dynamic. Good. Good. Yeah, good. Good stuff. So who has the best adaptive balance? And that means that this player can execute their strokes when they're outside of their ideal cylinder of balance. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I have my you thoughts. Know, yeah, you I want me you to do. answer? Or? Yes, I do. <laughs> Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I would say, and just thinking of visuals too that I've seen, um, although it's not complete information, but I, I would say Novak. Absolutely. He's the Gumby, right? And he can get in all kinds of predicaments and mm -hmm. stretches and awkward things, but he can still control and balance enough to execute a stroke and make a shot. He's yeah. absolutely the best in the world at that, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So. Gotcha. We've got some other answers, though. We've got Lisa... Ben and Cobb say Nadal. Wow. He's great. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know what? I think Nadal is a close second, actually. He's not that far off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I would say that this is not where, you know, Roger is at his absolute strength. Roger's strength is actually keeping his balance, keeping his posture more often and, and getting to the ball to play his strokes. Um, but when he gets out of his balance, he probably doesn't hit as an effective shot as mm -hmm. Novak or Rafa most of the time. And then, so how do we train, um, you know, normal balance as we think of it versus uh, adaptive balance? So inside our zone versus outside. Well, again, I think it's emphasis on starting with with the great posture and then committing yourself to maintaining that posture and getting to your contact points with that posture as often as you possibly can. And you know that is your intention. That is your your voluntary you know movement that you're trying to do. The outside the cylinder or the involuntary balance is just it's just an emergency situation um, that has that's going to happen. Your opponents are trying to get you out of balance. And so um, you can only improve that perhaps by knowing in advance that it's going to occur and still trying to execute your shot. Got it, John. Appreciate that. I just highlight a couple team. Well, you must like my poster right here then if you think it's <laughs> team. Uh, t I've seen a lot of uh, his workout videos and I mean, he's a monster for sure. Karthik uh, Monfils. Ben, if it's Novak, it's because of his wide base for stability. Very important. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that a wide base is a key element of, uh, of being a great athlete on the court. And uh, Again, one of those things that players, a lot of club players don't pay attention to is the, the width between their feet and maintaining that. So they end up standing and then they lack mobility and balance. So, uh, you know, wide stance, if you look at the pros, their feet are wider than their shoulders all the time when mm -hmm. they're when they're moving and they're ready position, when they're recovering, um, perhaps not when they're swinging, but they keep a wide base for stability and balance. For so. sure. And I remember talking to Dr. Mark Kovacs. Uh, he's a great expert in the area of uh, fitness overall, but, you know, fitness specific to tennis as well. And that, that was his take on it as well. Just the, 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 the more controlled you can stay w with a wider base, uh, or the wider uh, controlled base, uh, wide bases, um, for you, um, you know, the better, uh, you know, I, I think I jumbled the words, but you kind of get the point it, it, you know, if you have one athlete who is not very comfortable 
with a wide base and another one who is, then you're going to, you know, who's, uh, you know, going to be better on the court right. movement wise. So, um, John, now where exactly does technique come in? Because I, you know, obviously a lot of the factors that we've been talking about, they do go into that, but, um, a lot of people, they first and foremost think, oh uh, gosh, my, my foundation is basically my technique. So, um, talk to us a bit about your thoughts on technique and then how we're able to, to improve that and, and have a great foundation for technique. Yeah. You know, the, the second pillar that I really focus on the fundamental are the grips. And it's, it's so important that we play inside the range of what will be considered correct on all of our shots because it, the further you are outside of the range, the more you're going to have to compensate in some other way. And you, those compensations are going to lead you to, you know, underperforming, um, le less consistency, uh, and even, again, the potential for injuries. So you've got to be inside the range of correctness on your grips. Otherwise, there's going to be compensations that are going to be made. Um, and so that is, that is a key. The other component of grips that's important is tension. And I find that more than 90% of all tennis players have more tension, too much tension, to play at their best. So, you know, too much tension leads to, obviously, underperformance, poor, poor execution, and even, again, we're going to go back to injuries. So it's, it's a very important that not only do we know where we want to have the handle, hand on the racket, but how we want the hand to feel on the racket. That's critical. So if you, it, and one sort of reference point I use for all shots is kind of a universal guideline, is that you should be able to feel the weight of your racket head when you're holding the racket. If you're clutching the racket too tight, the racket head disappears, and that's evidence that you're holding on too tight. Beautiful. Another mm -hmm. just amazing point because, um, you know, our, our good mutual friend Peter Freeman uh, from Crunch Time Coaching, so he took a lesson from uh, legendary Rick Macy, who I've had on my summits and podcasts, and uh, I think he was getting a lesson regarding his forehand, trying to improve the, the technique, and then he basically asked Rick, oh, uh, what should I change on my forehand? And then Rick said five things. He said, relax, 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 relax. So that uh, that right there illuminates your point, John, about how important it is that we have a, you know, not too tight of a grip and obviously not super loose or anything like that. But I think that's a great um, standard that you put forth there that you should be able to feel the weight of the racket in your arm. Yeah, and I could give you an example here just to elaborate a little bit more so it's clear. Let me just put this uh, canine down here for a second. <laughs> oh, she's yeah. wrapped up in my she's wrapped up in my uh, cable too. So if I take the racket, for example, I'll give you an example here if I can do this. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm if I holding the racket and I grab it and I hold it tight, I can't feel the weight of the racket head. It's disappeared in my hand, and that's evidence of too much tension. So I want it to I want to soften so I can feel the weight of the racket head. Obviously, I don't want the racket head. I don't want to, I don't want to hold so soft that it dangles in my hand because now I don't have control. But I want to have it soft enough so I can feel the weight, and that's going to enable me to feel where my racket head is. It's going to take the tension out of my swing, and it's going to allow me to have a much more fluid movement that's much more efficient. So that's just a good guideline and. You know, there are, there are more details about how to hold the racket for every shot in tennis uh, that I get into, but that's a pretty good guideline to start with. John, a uh, question that came to mind, are there certain grips where you might need more, uh, uh, need to grip the, the, the grip tighter than others, you know, versus uh, obviously continental semi-western? I mean, is there any difference? I don't know that there's a difference between using those three grips. Maybe it's different shots. You know, um, for example, I don't really think about increasing my tension when I play a volley, but I probably do instinctively mm. uh, increase my tension as I play on the contact. Um, but it's not something that I really think about. I think more about having a soft hand and a firm wrist on the volley, for example, than I think about having a tight grip on the racket. I think that takes care of itself. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes Appreciate sense. It. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, not overthinking it as well. So a couple comments here, a few. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. From Charles, uh, I started tennis as a self-taught player, hence I never learned the split step. Um, occasionally now I force myself to do so on the practice court. Any suggestions to make this move more intuitive? Jump rope. 
It's mm. a great, it's a great exercise. Love it. Jump, jumping rope and learning to be skillful with the rope will get you to be light on your feet and and kind of get into the idea of your feet touch the court so they come back up again, and not settle into the court. That's that's going to help you with your split step. Yeah, I, I love the jump rope. It's an amazing tool. Uh, very economical as well. Yeah. Um, and let's see, we have a question from Stephen here, which is, how do you get young players to buy into constant footwork when they are just focusing on contacting the ball? Well, I think that if they're just focused on contacting the ball and not moving their feet, they're going to compromise their contact. So through experience, they're going to realize that uh, footwork is really the, the key thing that enables contact to occur. So... The strokes really follow the feet and, and the way I see the game. So um, it's, I think, you know, we see people all the time that are lazy in a way that, excuse me, lazier than they should be. I think they have to figure that out through encouragement and self-discovery. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. agree there. Um, let's see, we've got um, grip and release. The, I like it, Gene. Um, Alan, do you teach young kids to play an all-court game? That's a great question. You know, I don't teach kids that are under 10 to play an all-court game, but when I'm teaching them, I'm already envisioning that they're going to have an all-court game later, and I'm working on skills that are going to enable that to happen. So I, in my journey of teaching kids to play tennis, they're already learning the foundational skills, and we've got a few more to go through, that I'm building in them that I already know what I'm going to be able to get them to do later on. So, um, yes, I do teach them the principles that are going to enable them to play an all-court game. But when they're kids, they're not going to come to the net because they're just, they're just too vulnerable and they can't cover the court, so they're not going to do it. Got it. Got it, John. So, um, you know, after we go through this particular uh, element, I mean, what is the next element? And then let's go through as well some of the details and, and approaches to it. Yeah. So this next pillar is critical because it enables the – it really helps the other first two pillars and everything that comes after it as well. And that is in modern tennis, emphasis on using the non-dominant hand is a key part of the game. And the more you can involve your non-dominant hand in the game, right from the ready position, you know, where I teach my students in the ready position that if they're right-handed, their left hand is gonna cradle the racket and the right hand is gonna be resting in that soft position. So if we just go from the ready position to playing a forehand, the non-dominant hand is gonna create the unit turn it's going to help set up the contact, and it's going to help counterbalance and trigger the swing. And it, it's involved in the whole forehand. So the left hand, once you understand the role of the left hand and all the shots, it enables you to play much more co- with much more coordination, much more balance, and, and just organizes your game. And it, it really, really helps. Um, before modern tennis came around, I don't think anyone ever really talked about the non-dominant hand very much. It was sort of secondary. And you can look at forehands from the 70s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, and it almost looks like they're playing with their a forehand with their left hand almost in their pocket. It just <laughs> looks like it's non-existent. They didn't know what to do with it. But we found out now in modern tennis, in rotational tennis, angular tennis, the critical role, the non-dominant hand, in organizing and coordinating the strokes. Yeah, John, a great point. I mean, it's pretty much on everything, serve, forehand, um, backhand, uh, especially you can think of even, of course, uh, you know, generally the coaches say that we should be using uh, more of our left hand when we're hitting a two-handed backhand, but especially you can think of Federer on that one-handed extension. And so, um, I mean, besides the obvious approach of just <laughs> doing it on the practice court, I mean, what what are some, some ways that you have your students practice more, using their non-dominant hand more often? Well, the key is is that, and most players really neglect this, is that the ready position is dominated by the non-dominant hand. Mm-hmm. If, the, if my left hand is in charge of the racket in the ready position, then my first move is going to be initiated by that non-dominant hand. Mm-hmm. Whether I'm going to go play a two-handed backhand and make an adjustment with my right hand, the left hand is going to hold, and it's going to create the unit turn, and of course it plays through or whether I'm playing a backhand volley and it sets the racket up to play the play the contact and holds it till the last instant. So all these things can happen if the habit is built of having a professional ready position. And there's not enough emphasis on the value of a professional ready position. And that's that's a critical piece. If you think about it, if you if you start your movement to a ball from the same position every time, you get more and more skillful at making that movement. 
But if, you're, if your ready position is arbitrary and random, then there's no pattern to develop to get more skillful in, in your preparation and your movements. So I emphasize a, a professional ready position to be so important to developing your game. Got it. And then let, let's say, um, well, of course, so if you're, you're returning a, a serve, uh, do you recommend it? Let's say if you have a two-handed backhand, do you have your, your left hand on the backhand grip and your right hand in a forehand grip? Or what's your preferred ready position? Well, for a two-handed player, I do prefer that the, the non-dominant hand is on the handle adjacent to the playing hand because then you really only have to make one move. Mm. So, for example, and I can I can show you this here if you want to take a look. Sure. You know, when, I, when I'm in ready position as a two-handed player, my left hand is already in the position it needs to be in to play the backhand. All it needs to do is hold the racket so I can rotate the hand, rotate the right hand, to the continental grip to match up. So there's only one move. If it's up here, I've got to make a one, two, and I don't want to do that. So in my ready position as a return to serve, I've got my left hand in the position I'll play my shot in if I get a backhand, and I have a forehand grip. So now I only have to make one efficient move if I get a backhand. And I don't have to make any move if I get a forehand. I just simply go with my left hand and take me into the shot. So. That's that's the role of the non-dominant hand if you're a two-handed player. Very nice, very nice. And so, um, is there a particular shot that you find is where the non-dominant hand is the least used, where it should actually be used? So, in other words, it's trying to target like one area that that is uh, players make the biggest mistake in regards to not using the non-dominant hand. Well, I think. You see it everywhere, but I think it's probably more common that the a tennis player uh, thinks because I'm right-handed that my right hand is going to play the shot. So I emphasize it a lot, and there's really five big key things that the non-dominant hand does on the, on the modern forehand. And I think that players really have to understand that the non-dominant hand is kind of the manager of the shot. It, it kind of it, it, it sets up the preparation, it helps you find the contact, and it gives you a guide for the finish, and it coordinates the whole movement. So it kind of bookends the forehand. But I think it's very easy to think, well, I'm right-handed, so I'm just going to hit my forehand and, and not turn my shoulders and these things. And so the forehand becomes an isolated movement. You know, it's, it's often said that the forehand is the easiest shot to learn, but the hardest shot to master. If you get your non-dominant hand involved in the forehand, you'll master it. Yeah, and I, I really think, for, for me personally, the, one of the reasons why I think I have a good forehand is because I really make a great use of my non-dominant arm and hand and and I use it to you know to get that rotation really uh to a great point where then I can uncoil and so I've you know I'm I'm pushing uh my body back with it and uh that has helped me quite a bit, bit with my shots so um definitely a great point there and uh yeah Becky great point on the grip appreciate that Becky um that John made <laughs> uh totally agree finger spread uh, and then tennis nine seven nine, great question. Do you recommend yoga, Pilates, and physical therapy to address physical issues along with footwork? Absolutely. There was a period in time when I I actually was playing quite a bit of golf back in the nineties when golf was kind of a big craze here, and I ended up getting an injury in my back. And uh, I went uh, to uh, physical therapy, did a lot of different things, but you know what? I got into yoga. And I did yoga for extensively for probably five, seven years. And uh, it is, yoga is amazing. I, I think not only does it help you with your strength and your flexibility, but it also helps you with your calmness. Uh, so the breathing element. And it actually made me a, a more relaxed player, both in golf and in tennis. I think the yoga is a critical component to, to your fitness. Uh, physical therapy, uh, I do have a great physical therapist locally, and I do get a few nags here and there. Um, from playing for so many years, it's just re repetition and so forth. And yeah. I think physical therapy is a great way to address, you know, injuries that you may have and make sure you're in alignment and so forth. Yeah, 100%, uh, John. And so I think we've we, we've covered three so far of the five. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Physical, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then so after um, you know getting uh, the use of the non-dominant hand 
to mm-hmm. hopefully become second nature for you in all aspects of the different strokes uh, as necessary, then what is the next f- foundational principle that you focus on? The next thing I really, really focus on are the contact points. And I find that most players, you know, they get information like hit the ball out in front or or you're late or you're early or whatever. But a lot of players just don't really know where the ideal contact points are. And, you know, that is the moment of truth that determines really where the what the ball does. And the primary skill we're trying to learn is how to get to the ideal contact point. So if you don't know where those are, then you're just kind of guessing when the ball comes. And you're going to make more mistakes. So, you know, everything we do as a tennis player is intended to get us to and through the ideal contact points. So it's so critical that you know where those are for all of your shots and try to achieve those contact points as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and great stuff, John. And is there like a universal standard for finding your contact point for every mm-hmm. shot? Does it, or is there, does it vary among shots, grips, et cetera? Well, it certainly does vary somewhat because we're all different dimensionally. We have different grips. To some degree, we have different ranges of flexibility. So there are always going to be factors that that will affect where your ideal contact points are. But if we just take the forehand again as an example, and you have great posture, and, and you go out to a natural place like, say, did you go to your refrigerator this morning? You went to your refrigerator. Yeah, sure you did. Did you stop three feet before the refrigerator and reach for the door? (laughs) No. Or did you walk up where maybe it's comfortable and powerful and you're balanced to pull the door open? The latter, for sure. Sure. And when you drive a car, do we drive with our hands in or do we drive where our hands and arms are comfortable and we have have balance? Or we're working on a keyboard. So there's a natural place where you're able to maintain balance and posture and generate what feels like a natural and comfortable movement into a ball. And you can find some of that and discover some of that on your own, but you probably need a, a seasoned specialist who can actually help you refine that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, let's go to a question here. We've got Ben. Hello, Ben. Um, on the backhand ground strokes, I think we're going back a, uh, quite a bit, not a quite a bit, but to one previous principle. Oh, no problem. Um, on the backhand ground stroke, do you consider that the right hand... Uh, do you consider the right hand the non-dominant hand for the unit turn and then emphasize the left hand more on the shot? So I'm a, I'm a right-handed player. I'm a one-handed backhand. And when I'm in ready position, my, my non-dominant hand is in control of the racket. And my non-dominant hand uh, obviously takes control and allows me to make my grip change as I enter into my unit turn. And my non-dominant hand sets and holds the racket. And it actually is the timing mechanism that is going to release the racket to advance forward to the ball. So my non-dominant hand is actually the dominant hand until the point it releases and allows my right shoulder to rotate and take control of the swing to the ball. But the left hand is not done. It's going to counterbalance that forward movement from the right arm by going back and holding balance, which enables you to keep balance and power and control together. And that's why when you look at pictures of Federer or Grigor Dimitrov and so forth, you you see that left hand behind them. It's just counterbalancing the move. So, yeah, the left hand takes it starts the movement, and the right arm takes over the power. But the left hand is a key element to all of that. Yeah, for sure, John. Appreciate that. Good question, Ben. And uh, with the contact point, John, uh, do do players tend to? Um, hit the ball too far out in front of them or uh, too late? Well, I think it's I think it's situational. I think more often players are forced into being late, uh, but certainly players can be early too. And, and a component of that is just your ability to track and anticipate the ball coming in. So, you, you know, part of all of this is, in, is understanding and anticipating the ball uh, after it's been played by your opponent. So, when, when your opponent hits the ball, you're, you're not just trying to see the ball, but you're, you're trying to look for the characteristics of the ball, you know, what angle it, what it, it's hit on. And you respond to that angle, then you're looking for speed, the spin, the, the height, and the length. And you're, you're trying to blend those together and adapt to the ball and anticipate the ball so you can get a position to play it. You know, it's, it's said that uh, high-performance players actually see the play before it occurs. Mm-hmm. And the more you can 
the better you skill you can get at anticipating and actually seeing or understanding what you're going to do before you do it, the more you can execute with purpose and confidence. Got you, John. Appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and Ben has a follow up. He was wondering about what about the two hander. And- uh, the two handed backhand, the, the way I teach it, is almost completely dominated by the non dominant hand. Mm. Uh, the non dominant hand is in charge in the ready position. It enables the right hand to rotate into the continental grip, and then the left hand just takes charge, and it is the driving force all the way through the shot. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. And so we got a question uh, from Adolfo. Can I play with a one-handed backhand without overdeveloping one side of the body and getting injured by that imbalance? Well, I, I, you, we have a player at our club who he might he could he'd be watching right now. I don't know. He plays his backhand, one-handed backhand, with his left hand completely uninvolved, and he manages to make shots, but he's easy to break down. He really he can't get any real torque. He really isn't offensively minded with it. He can't really hit the ball hard. Uh, can't create a lot of spin, and he looks like he's vulnerable to getting an injury. So yeah, you could play without your non dominant hand, but you're not going to achieve your full potential. So I think you're you're better off establishing that non dominant hand and getting that involved in your backhand. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, and I think Adolfo, you you know, obviously there's a lot of. Professional players and other players who aren't um, having ill effects by using a one-hander. So I do know that you can obviously, uh, you, you should be working on your physical uh, strength and mobility and so forth. So, you you know, you can do things like unilateral exercises in the gym to make sure that you don't develop too much of an imbalance or anything like that. So there's certainly ways to, to mitigate those, um, you know, imbalances that may occur. Um, let's see. Gene asks, should the left hand stay on the racket at the beginning of a backhand volley or snap away? The, the, the way I teach the, the one-handed backhand volley is that the non-dominant hand holds the racket until you feel like the ball is almost on the strings. And then it times the release and then allows your playing shoulder to jab the racket head into the ball. Mm. You know, If you think about it, if your muscles can only contract one way at any given time. So if your left hand, or for me, my left hand's not involved in getting the racket in front of the oncoming ball, and I'm using my shoulder muscle to, to place the racket, well, that muscle is already occupied. And then there's a whole lot less muscle to actually use that's not on reserve to fire the, the jab to the ball. So what I want to do is I want the non-dominant hand to hold the racket till the last instant and let my right shoulder, my playing shoulder, just stay on reserve and be ready to take that jab at the right instant which is actually created by the non-dominant hand. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the non-dominant hand is going to hold until the last instant. Great stuff. Appreciate that. And, yeah, the questions are starting to pour in here. (laughs) Uh, I've got another one from Ben. Is the left hand the – is that the right one? Yeah, is the left hand the dominant hand on the two-handed backhand, thus you use the right hand to take it back? Uh, The right hand just floats and goes along for the ride. Uh, the take back. It's not really engaged. Uh, I, I don't want the two hands competing with each other. Um, the right hand is on there and it acts somewhat like a guide, but it is not pulling the racket forward. And the left hand is actually you know, going to be really in charge of the take back as well. Got it. Beautiful. Uh, so we have tennis 979. Diaphragmatic breathing is a key component, in my opinion. Um, what do you think there, John? Well, unfortunately, I'm not totally familiar with what that term is, but I'm going to assume that that is deep breathing that engages your diaphragm. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we know from many other things that, that, uh, including yoga, that that deep breathing is critical to relaxation and um, calmness. So I would say that that is an uh, important thing to develop. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so we've got uh, Jordan. Um, what is the best way to develop cardio for tennis? And then she actually has a follow-up later. It's running, biking, or jump rope. Well, I think what we've learned over the years, and, and when I was growing up and playing and so forth in the 70s, we were doing a lot of distance running because we felt that we needed endurance. But I think we've discovered over time that the endurance comes along with a lot of court hours and playing and what we want to work on are intervals. So Mm -hmm. 
I think we want to be doing more things where we do a 30 second intensive interval and then a 15 to 20 second rest period, just so we're matching and mimicking what we actually do in match play so that our body rhythms and our heartbeat and our, our absorption of oxygen and all those things actually really simulate exactly what we're doing as we're, as we're playing. Yeah, great, John. I, I really agree, obviously, with that. Um, you know, all the, the experts pretty much have said, you know, you don't want to be doing things like long, very long distance running or, or biking or et cetera. Instead, you know, you can still run, but perhaps interval running, sprinting would be ideal. Uh, of course, don't forget the lateral movement. Um, same thing with biking or and jump roping. You know, you can make it into shorter bursts of uh, ideally mimicking the time, uh, you know, of the, of, of the court, you know, of when you're playing a match as far as like how many seconds you play and then um, rest as well. That's just always a great um, way to approach it. Um, let's see, Cobb, what drills do you recommend to help to keep my non-dominant hand involved in the forehand? Well, one of the things that I really encourage my students to do, and I've done a lot of it, and I did a lot of it when I was younger as well, is is shadow work and practice without the ball. Because the ball the ball is a bit of a distraction. And if, if you think about it, a lot of these movements, we want them to become choreography, which means they're almost just planned movements that start to happen naturally. So um, if you think about like a dancer, if, if you're trying to learn a dance, and the dance teacher turns the music on before you know your choreography, what's going to happen? So it, it's going to break down. It's not going to work. you got to know your choreography first, and then you can adapt that choreography to music. And in tennis, the ball is the music. So if you can work on your choreography and build your skills off the court, then things like the non-dominant hand and posture and so forth, those become habits. Those start to find their way into your, into your skill set naturally. And then when the ball comes, you maintain those and you play. But I would do a lot of shadow work. Yeah, shadow swings are great, and you know I've said a few times, and many people have that. Um, you know, even if we're restricted from going onto the court, uh, it's the perfect time to be doing shadow swings inside the house uh, or on your driveway. It's um, you know, it, and it's so important in, in developing that great foundation. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, uh, David. Uh, I've read those intermittent bursts and rests are also superior to long, moderate cardio for overall cardiovascular health, too. That's a great point there. Yeah. Um, and Becky, back, if I would just go back real quick to uh, that last question, though. Yeah. When you're shadowing, if you can get in front of a mirror and do mirror work, it's going to help you quite a bit because you, you're going to – we instinctively see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And, and if you get in front of a mirror, you're going to get an image of what you're doing, and that's going to help so much. So get in front of a mirror as well yeah okay. great point yeah great point there yeah. and becky should be tennis specific that's right um i want to get into uh just to make sure that we we complete uh the you know the the foundations uh that we need to to concentrate on uh john so um after the contact point then what is the next step for us the, well the, the next key component of the pillar and it really kind of ties everything together is really how to generate both power and control into and through the ball. And we want to make sure that at least in the foundational stages and we're really trying to hone this, this architecture in our game that our, we're really playing through our core. We're playing as a unit of movement and that our, our movements are really coming through the shoulders. Ultimately, the shoulders are going to rotate prior to the swing moving to the ball on virtually every shot. So the power and control and the coordination of the movement is going to be from the shoulders through the shoulder. And I can give you, a, you know, an example on the forehand again, which will, which will really make sense to you. And it applies virtually to every other shot as well. So when I go to play a forehand, when I go to play a forehand, I do my unit turn and I get a nice coil. And then I get a nice stretch out here with my left hand. And then when my left hand pulls away, it initiates the rotation of the body in, and this is a fairly rapid movement, and then the left hand stalls me, and that rotational energy transfers through the hitting shoulder. And what I want to feel here is I want to feel as though I'm driving into and through the ball with the big muscle. I don't want to come in here and play through the wrist. I don't want to play through the elbow. I want to be playing with the big muscle rotating and then letting that energy transfer through the hitting shoulder so that I get out here. So the racket head gets here because of this movement a lot less than, say, here or here. 
And that's pretty much the fundamentals, the fundamental principle on every shot is that the power and control is going to be through the shoulders and into the hitting shoulder. And we're going to de-emphasize um, wrist and elbow movement on most things. Now, obviously, the serve is different in a way, but the power and control is still coming through the shoulders. And that's a key thing to really understand how to get your, your core to work in a coordinated way to deliver the power through the, through the stroke. Got it. Yeah. And I mean, what are some other specific exercises or anything like that that we can actually do to get used to that type of um, full body uh, movement and, and emphasizing um, the core and shoulder, like you mentioned? Yeah. And in the warm up routine and, and program that I have, uh, emphasizes a lot of that. There's there's skills that are built inside of that. It's, it's interesting because when I start with a student, and I work with a lot of you know juniors, they'll they'll kind of roll their eyes. Why am I doing this? And what you really want me to do this? Why? Whatever. And then you know six months later, they'll look at me and go, "Cha ching! Yeah. Now I know why you had me doing that. That makes total sense. Now I got it. Now I understand where that why you had me you know exercise doing that exercise." And I go, "Yeah, I know. You, I knew you were going to find out." So. If you get a good warm routine that's that's mimicking these functional movements and these principles, they'll start to show up and blend into your game. Yeah, beautiful, great stuff. Yeah. Um, Zen Muz, I believe, um, for the forehand, how do you synchronize the non-dominant hand with the incoming ball to not have the non-dominant hand too long on the racket and not be jammed? You know, that's a that's a great question. I love that question. You know, oftentimes players let go of the racket too early and then the racket kind of gets lost or the length of the backswing gets, gets long and, and out of control. And so what I have students do is, is try to hold on with the left hand it, it, longer than they think they should. And then they discover that the left hand instinctively lets go so they can go and play the ball. Now, if you are late, then obviously your calculation of that movement is, is off. And perhaps it's because you're misjudging the ball or you don't know where your contact point is and there's, there's other things that are going on. But I, I think it's a fun exercise to, to challenge yourself to see if you can hold it a little longer than you think you should. And then what happens is the racket naturally accelerates to catch up to the contact point, And you actually can oftentimes produce a pretty good shot from that. Great stuff, yeah. And so Ben says, it seems to me shadow tennis is good even if you can't be on the court. Uh, that Oh, if you, even if you can be on the court. Yeah, I think either way it's it's uh, very important um, for your development. Um, and then with uh, Adolfo's question, I think, John, that you answered it, and so I'll just try to summarize how the left hand is used to avoid over-rotation. So, um, you know, at some point in, in the stroke, it's it's actually stopping your momentum, um, you know, so that you, you're not, like, just swinging it to, all the way to the left. You're actually stopping it. Um, I mean, is that kind of, uh, you know, this good summarization? Is, is there anything you have to add to that? I think you're right on. I think if you look at, you know, the common position of the non-dominant hand when – players on the WTA or ATP tour are making swinging into contact, that hand is stalled. And oftentimes that hand looks like it's firm. It's holding balance. It's not floating. Uh, Federer looks a little floaty because he's just so natural at everything he does. But look at Nadal's hand. Look at Djokovic's and Murray's hand. And they're all, they've got that hand so it's just stiff and it's holding their balance as they enter into the contact. And that enables that energy to transfer into the swinging shoulder just like a field goal kicker runs and plants the opposite foot to allow the kicking foot to accelerate through the ball. It's a, it's concept wise. It's not that dissimilar. Yeah. Yeah. No, great point there. Yeah. Medicine ball throws. Ben says, uh, yeah, medicine ball throws are great. Um, let's see, Alan, could you spend a moment on drop shots? Is there anything, um, that you, you know, you'd like to, <laughs> I guess, uh, any tips on the drop shot? <laughs> Well, again, I think if your foundation is solid and you're using your non-dominant hand and you're able to make grip adjustments and then you make good choices um, you know, about when to play a drop shot, that's something that you can enter into your game. But I think, it's, um, I think again, it's important that if, if you don't have a foundation, these kinds of variations and uh, adaptations and, and skills and game styles are very difficult to perform. So get your foundation right, and then you can get out there and find that you can create variation in your game. I do have a, a good video on my YouTube channel. Check it out. It's on the drop shot. It teaches you how to play it, when to play it, and what the real advantages are, and why it's so popular on the tour today. 
Very nice. Yeah, definitely everybody check out uh, John's YouTube channel, Performance Plus Tennis. Um, let's see what else. So I guess, yeah, um, definitely want to ask a few more questions about the foundation. I mean, one is, you know, maybe there's a concern from certain people. Does the foundation create robotic tennis? That's a great question. Um, it actually doesn't. It, it leads you, if it's, if it's done sequentially the right way and you really follow the principles, it actually leads you to becoming a very natural, fluid player in your own style. So there could be some checkpoints or things that you do where you check your balance and so forth that are not robotic, but they're, but they're points where maybe you stop your motion. But it, at the end of the day, you're going to start to feel very natural and fluid and comfortable and efficient on the court. So this, it's not a robotic uh, approach at all. Got it. Got it. Great stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so as far as the foundation, I think, you know, we've, we've covered, I believe, the five uh, principles of it. And, and so I guess maybe just to kind of wrap it up as a whole, um, what, you know, what, what exactly is the, the, the best approach? I mean, do we, do we always go through that five in order and work on it, uh, sequentially in terms of, um, you know, the physical, the, the movement, um, the, in other words, the, uh, technique, the use of the non-dominant hand contact points, and then, um, how to generate power and control. Do we go through those one by one? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and as far as the foundation is concerned, the way that uh, I present it and teach it, what's what's unique about it, and also will help, is that the same five principles you learn, you apply to every shot of tennis. So it's it's not like you're learning how to hit a forehand with these ideas, and then you go over and hit a backhand. It's completely different. So if you just learn how to use the principles and apply them differently to each shot, it actually simplifies the process. Um, and you'll also notice that the sequence that we actually went through them is actually what you actually do when you receive a tennis ball. You move first. You you obviously have a grip that you have to get into. You you use your non-dominant hand. You get to the contact point, and then you play through the shot. So the sequence is the same, and how you use these fundamentals is just how you adapt them to the different shots is what the key thing you really need to, to learn and understand. As far as practicing them is concerned, as we talked about earlier, you really can only focus on one or maybe two things at once. So my recommendation is if you're out on the practice court, go out there with a purpose and say, you know what, for the first 30 minutes today, I'm gonna to focus on my footwork and my posture, my balance, my rhythm of movement, and just focus in on that. And it, it doesn't have to be 30 minutes, maybe it's 15 minutes until you feel satisfied that that is sort of in place and you, you're happy with that. And then start to focus maybe on your left hand, on your non-dominant hand, and work on that skill exclusively while you're still moving your feet, so while you're still implementing good footwork. Um, and then you can go through the different steps. Now, the key thing is that the four of these principles become habits. And one of them is the one you're ultimately going to zero in on. Can anybody tell me which one you're going to zero in on and what the other four are that are become habits. Mm. Mm. Which one is which one is the one you're going to zero in on? Ultimately, that's going to set you free to, as well to play. Mm. That was my hint. <laughs> Any answers? <laughs> I think, uh, I think I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm just typing to encourage people to try and take a guess. Okay, we've got uh, Ben thinks the first one is it, um, the uh, movement. Uh, we've got posture. Got uh, relaxation. Uh, let's see. We'll give it a couple more okay. seconds. <laughs> Has anyone... Okay, breathing, Jordan. Remember, we're talking about the five principles here. We're talking about footwork. We're talking about grips, we're talking about uh, the not rolling on the dominant hand, we're talking about contact points, and we're talking about the power and control. Those are your five options. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got balance. Yeah, so breathing wasn't one of the five, right? Have you, has anyone hit it yet, John? No. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll spill the beans. You know, if you get out and work on your footwork and movement, it's going to be become a habit. Okay. Yes. If you if you get out and you work on your non dominant hand, it's going to become a habit. You're going to do it without thinking about it. Oh. Okay. 
if you um, know your grips, you're gonna you're gonna get into your grips without thinking about them. And if you stroke through the ball and know how to get power and control and rhythm through your body and your core, that's going to become a habit. What's not going to be a habit, naturally, is zeroing in on the ball and playing to the contact point. So once, you're, once your habitual skills are built on the four pillars, you just focus on the ball and getting to the contact point because that's the key element that the other four pillars are supporting to enable you to really play through that contact. So that becomes ultimately what you focus on. And when you zero in on the ball and you're focused in on it, it looks like a basketball, mm-hmm. you've set yourself free to play with freedom, confidence, and belief in what you're doing. I see. So you're, you're building those other four habits, the footwork, grips, use of non-dominant hand, how to, um, yeah, all of them. And then, and then that just feeds into um, the contact point. And then once you develop those four, then you can just... Um, play freely is what you're saying right you you have to respond to a ball and adapt to a ball and that's that's always a that's always a measurement isn't it so that's the thing you're going to zero in on oh very nice very nice let's see if we have any other questions um i think there was one back here oh yes uh did we cover this john if you use the modern topspin forehand and backhand and your opponents are hitting flat nothing balls which are difficult to shape and control do you recommend just hitting flat balls back? Well, if, if, a, if an opponent is hitting a hard level flat ball to you and it's got a lot of speed, it can be difficult to generate a lot of heavy topspin on the way back. So oftentimes you, the shot you play this is influenced somewhat by the ball you receive. Um, but I think at the same time, you're going you're gonna to blend in your own natural style of play. So if you're a topspin player and that's what you do, you're, you're, you're probably still going to be hitting topspin off of a flat ball. I would probably try, what I would probably do if, is I would probably try to dictate my topspin and get the ball up out of their strike zone so it's less comfortable for them to hit flat to you. And now you're dictating the play. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. So, John, what does it take? Because, I mean, we can obviously talk about the pillars and um, have people uh, review them and so forth. But what, what does it take to actually get these um you know these this tennis foundation as a whole integrated into our our uh, daily play um what 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 does it take well it 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 takes uh an investment uh of of knowledge to getting the knowledge to to know what to do the sequence in which to do it in and having a meaningful practice plan that will enable these these principles to begin to find their way into your game. You know, nothing's going to happen overnight. And, you know, if we're going to play tennis for the next 20, 30, 40 years, so what if it takes you six months of commitment to, to develop the game that you really would love to have? So, you know, you got to have a, you have to have a meaningful practice plan. You have to go to the court with, with, with purpose. And you have to know what it is you're trying to do when you get there. So... Um, and I would, again, I would almost practice these and develop these in the sequence in which we even talked about them today. First order of business is make sure that you're, you feel like you're really becoming a better athlete on the court so that you have longevity, reduce injuries, keep a better balance, better alignment, all those things. I would start there, and then the other ones are going to be easier to build. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And out of all of these, out of the five, which one... Do players generally have the most uh, problems with? Well, I think at the club level, players tend to have trouble with their with the first one, and then the rest of them have they have trouble with the rest of them because the first one's not in. So, um, I think that that's probably where it begins. I mean, I, I think that you know, you could say, well, I I was late on the shot, and it, is that a cause or a symptom? Well, oftentimes it's a symptom of something else. And so uh, you have to look at what the really root causes are and where things originate to figure out what's going right or going wrong. So I would say for most club level players, and I've coached a lot of high school players as well, and it's very easy to distinguish a JV player from a varsity player. It is almost always footwork. So uh, I think more club level players, if you're, if you're a three, five and you want to be a four or four, five, that, that journey is going to originate with your athleticism and your footwork. Yeah. And it doesn't just mean run around the court and waste energy. It's learning how to move and glide and balance on the court um, like, a, like a natural athlete that's efficient and allows you to produce good shots. So there, it's a bit of an art form to really understand how to develop the footwork. 
Yeah, I mean, and something that I like to do periodically is um, when it, when there's pro tennis available to be watched, or it's you know, and even on YouTube, of course, um, is to just turn the sound off and just focus on one of the players' footwork, and mm -hmm. um, it's really illuminating at how hard they're uh, and efficiently too that their their feet are mm -hmm. are moving across the court. Um, and Jordan uh, just requests one once more, if you don't mind, listing uh, the five again for everybody. John. Well, it begins with uh, your, your footwork, and, and the footwork uh, c category is, is mobility. It, it allows you to, to maintain, establish and maintain balance and posture. It gives you rhythm of movement on the court, gives you agility. So the footwork is a big piece. Uh, having grips that are inside the range of correctness so that you can play within your balance points naturally is really important and generate power and control. Uh, Using the non-dominant hand to organize and, and counterbalance all of your movements is critical. Uh, knowing where your contact points are uh, is essential because otherwise you're just guessing when the ball comes. And then ultimately understanding how to use the body as a unit of movement to create power and control. Beautiful. Awesome. Thanks for that, John. Uh, Cobb, do you recommend hitting against a wall to help develop a good foundation? It, it, the, the wall is fine. You get it. You know you're getting the ball back, so you're going to improve your preparation. It's coming back. I would um, encourage you to not tr hit the ball too hard. It's easy to get against a wall and start hit, overhitting, but I think you're going to be you're going to learn these skills by going slow. And uh, I saw this uh, saying the other day. It said, "The slower you go, the faster you will get there." So, in a way, that kind of makes sense. Take your time so that you can actually execute and feel the movements and build the habits. Yeah, beautiful. Very yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, some nice comments here. Tennis979, thanks for all the good info. Alan, thanks, John, for a great lesson. Love it. Um, so just to close with a few questions, John, um, what are three books that you would gift to a friend to help them improve their tennis game? Wow. Uh, I love, I love the book by uh, Jeff Greenwald. I think it's, it's like 50 uh, quick tips, um, mm -hmm. which really helps you sort of, and, and I read that book and, and some of them I resonated with some of the tips and other ones, you know, maybe didn't, didn't, I didn't connect with, but that book was great because it's a quick read and, and you can extract uh, several things out of there that uh, you can, you can remember that will help you. So I like that book a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved Timothy Galloway's, you know, um, book, The Inner Game of Tennis. I mean, it's timeless. It's, it's, I think it was, he probably wrote it, what, in 1975, but it's still a wonderful book to read. And, um, because what we're trying to do is figure out how to think as well. And, you know, part of the process of getting better in tennis is not just learning skills, but one of the prevailing skills we need to learn is, is how to learn and focus on what we're trying to do, oftentimes when we're receiving a ball. That's complicated for people. They get so consumed in the ball that they're not able to actually feel or think about what they're trying to do. So, you know, Timothy Galloway's book is, a, is an excellent book um, from the mental standpoint. Um, from a technical standpoint, um, one of the books that I really like is uh, from the great Welby Van Horn, who w had a great foundation that he taught. Um, he was a great teacher in his book, uh, Secrets of a Tennis Master, um, is, a, is a great book for foundational uh, information as well. So those are probably, I think, my three top ones. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. Um, and we'll definitely link up to them. Uh, in the show notes. And uh, John, if you could erect a giant billboard in the most highly trafficked area where you live um, in California, then where, or sorry, then what uh, would you actually write on that billboard? And it could be about anything. Wow. You're throwing some curveballs at me. <laughs> I try. <laughs> but it doesn't have to relate to tennis necessarily. It doesn't have to, no. Okay. I would say that um, give it your best every day and be, you know, be the very best person you can be, whether you're a tennis player or you're an opponent or you're in business or you're a doctor or a tennis coach. It doesn't matter. Students, I would say, you know, wake up every day and say, I'm going to be better today than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Love yeah. it. Love it. That's, that's huge. Um, it's, 
much easier said than done, but uh, very powerful. If you can remind yourself of that quote, um, you know, once in a while, I think it'll help a lot. So, um, John, you do a lot of great work. Uh, where can we uh, connect with you? You know, my website is called Performance Plus Tennis. And you can head on over there and, you know, I've got a variety of different free lessons that, that reveal a lot of the concepts that we're talking about and present things that players do. Uh, on the website, I also have uh, some courses that are available on the serve. Um, even though we haven't talked much about the serve, the serve is actually the, the stroke that I really love to teach because I, I'm challenged by it and I, uh, it's complex and I've spent years studying it. So I have a, a serve foundation course, which has uh, helped hundreds and hundreds of players develop a professional quality serve over the last few years. Um, I also have a VIP membership that's available that, that covers all the strokes and develops all these principles in detail and also teaches you and presents drills to develop these skills. So I do have a, a comprehensive instructional program on the website. And you can also uh, check out more things on the YouTube channel, uh, Performance Plus Tennis. And then we've got close to 100 instructional videos on there as well that will give you a good feel for a lot of these concepts. Fantastic, John. Yeah. Um, and is, is there any, uh, any social profiles that you want to shout out as well for people to follow? You know, I, I don't really do much on the Instagram at this point in time. It's something mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, okay, we're looking at doing and considering, but YouTube is the place where I really am and the website. And that's, that's, that's really where you can find me. And if you have questions or comments, you can contact me through the website. We've got a contact us page. Feel free to reach out. Great, John. Yeah, I've been trying to search everywhere for your selfies, and I just I can't find them, John. So, <laughs> but uh, no, no, that's that's great. You're obviously very passionate and um, creating great content on YouTube and uh, having a lot of great people uh, follow. As we can see, people here from uh, Performance Plus Tennis. Uh, let's see. We got some very nice comments. Um, Stephen, thank you both for your time. John, you're a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Becky, thank you so much. A lot of other. Um, yeah, Alan, thanks for a great lesson. Uh, great stuff, uh, John. So, uh, I asked this of all my guests before the, uh, we end the episode and the question is, what is one key tip that you can give us to help us improve our tennis games? Uh, that's a great question. A lot of different answers. I yeah, so many. <laughs> Pick your favorite. So, so, you know, I think that ultimately, Tennis players, um, you know, it's, it's a very emotional game and we have to remove our emotions from it. And, and I, I think back to the comment that Rafael Nadal said when he won the U.S. Open last year. And one of the, one of the people in the media room said, so how did you, you win this tournament? And he, and he looked at me and said, one a ball at a time. Mm. And it's just kind of like the billboard. Be the best you can be. What's the most important shot tennis? It's always the next one. And play every ball as if it's the last ball in the match give it 100 um, percent it's just like it's just like making one step better than the other one get better with every step try to get better with every ball that you play love it love it john uh thank you very much for coming on to the podcast really appreciate it uh it's, it's always great to chat with you and you know you've put forth some really great content on your youtube channel on the summit and, and now here on the podcast and uh, a lot of people I've enjoyed this live broadcast and uh, it's obviously going to be up on the all podcast platforms uh, in the very, very near future. So uh, on Wednesday morning. So, uh, John, I just want to thank you again for coming on and wishing you the best and wishing you and your family uh, safe, uh, you know, that, that you'll that you'll be safe and happy and everything. And uh, looking forward to connecting again in the next uh, piece of content that we uh, create. That's great. And, you know, I want to thank you so much for all you do for tennis. Uh, you're obviously very passionate and you're helping the game grow and helping people get better. And um, it's, it's wonderful, all the work that you put in into the tennis. So I want to thank you so much for that and be safe and healthy. Thanks a lot. And appreciate that, John. And thank you to everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. And we will see you on the next episode. So uh, goodbye for now, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.